Good morning. Uh, thank you to the organizing committee and Manos for Relagis for the invitation. Uh, I'm a heart failure cardiologist and I feel very welcome uh, here uh, already. Uh, I show the consensus paper with uh, HFSA included as well and my friend Naveen already welcomed me earlier today uh, here. So we'll talk about the team approach to cardiogenic shock and how heart failure cardiologists, interventional surgeons can work together. So we're going to review rationale actions to develop a shock team and uh, what data we have already available. So starting with the rationale, one of the things that we all know that it's so diverse in shock is the etiology, the causes of shock. And I don't need to review with you uh, this classic uh, slide uh, and uh, multifactorial etiologies of uh, cardiogenic shock. And then if you go a little bit more specific to the type of the ventricular failure, I'm going to use still images to make the point. You can see here an acute on chronic dilated, uh, as dilated as it can get. Uh, you can see the sphere of the left ventricle. But here you can see that the left ventricle is small and the right ventricle is uh, dilated. Again, you can get the patient to shock with this. And of course, we often have restrictive physiologies and uh, small ventricles, and still you can get so there's diversity of scenario, and even more than those, it's just examples. And you need to deal not just with the heart. You need to deal with the lungs. You need to deal with the periphery. When we say periphery, we mean vessels. We mean uh, extracellular, intracellular uh, space. And uh, this is getting more and more complex uh, as you need to manage uh, respiratory failure, dialysis, often the kidneys go down. And devices that they can be complex. And you can get the patient with lots of devices around, surrounded and uh, the team uh, approach becomes uh, necessary. So the severity of the shock is also diverse. When we initially saw this, this is from the Intermax, the mandatory registry for ventricular assist devices. When we saw that the shock was divided initially in Intermax in seven profiles, we felt, oh, that's too much. Well, that's the profiles of the patients. And it's uh, complex and diverse. Mechanical options. You heard a few of uh, the options uh, in the prior talk, and Naveen will continue with some of the details. I'm just going to quickly go, I mean, you are all familiar. Balloon pumps, impellas, tandem hearts, ECMOs for the right side, uh, failure, RP, ECMO. We have surgical devices for left and right support. So you, if you put everything together, we already review those, and there are many more that add to the complexity comorbidities, age, psychosocial evaluation, and potential to affect the exit strategy in these shock patients, and are we going to bridge to bridge, are we going to bridge to recovery, are we going to... So all these things, if you put them together, make uh, the... Uh, it, it's evident that you need probably more than one brain there thinking about all these things. And the experience we have from other teams, it's favorable. And you are all familiar in your institutions with teams like this that they tackle complex problems uh, in a successful way. If you go to see what we have to guide the decision of one single uh, physician trying to figure out this, you go to the guidelines, for example, you can see here that everything is level C at the most level B. So these, again, suggest that we, we don't have enough to guide. Uh, and so that's the rationale. Uh, for developing a shock team to deal with these difficult situations. So actions, is this feasible? Can we do that? So this is a, uh, a very nice paper. Uh, some of the authors are, are here in, in the room, uh, which was published about a year and a half ago. And uh, they tried in this paper to outline some of the goals that you need and to achieve when you have a shock team. And you need to be able to uh, help rapidly identify the shock and uh, determine the underlying etiology. Maximize survival through uh, utilization of revascularization and other supportive therapies. And need to know when to escalate versus when to withdraw. And the ethics question comes into play often. And these are difficult discussions that if you have a team there, makes it much easier. So. Usually when we talk about shock teams, if you get it down to practical elements, it should include a heart failure cardiologist, an interventional cardiologist, a critical care CVSU attending, which most of the time could be a cardiologist as well, and a heart failure thoracic uh, surgeon. And the infrastructure that you need to have 
and the communication between the various teams. It's going to take uh, place in the cath lab, in the OR, and the intensive care. That's why you need these specialties. Protocols, there are a few protocols out there published. I'm not going to go into the details in the interest of time. I'm going to walk you through our own protocol that we started one and a half uh, years ago, uh, almost two years ago. And it, the, the major determinant of this protocol is simple. Make it simple. So somebody smells shock. The fellow is instructed to page without any specific criteria. We want the pre-shock. We want a low bar. So the fellow page the shock team. The shock team doesn't come into the hospital if it's in the middle of the time. The shock team is the half year attending, is the interventional attending, and the CVICU attending. In our institution, most of the time, is the same person as the half year attending. And then the surgeon is in touch with the half year attending. They talk all the time about donors and other things, so he knows where to find him. We don't have as many surgeons. We don't want to wake them up in the middle of the night in every single pre-shock case. And then the next decision point is, is this a STEMI? And if it's a STEMI, <laughs> or not, defines the next two steps of the algorithm. If it's not a STEMI, then we have time. Even for non-STEMIs, we have time. We're going to write our cath. And then if by the right our cath and the clinical criteria, you meet these in the blue box, then MCS, mechanical circulatory support, a form of MCS is considered. We are not going to define what type of MCS in the protocol. The shock team will define that based on its experience and the presentation of the patient. And, and that's where we have it. And then, of course, the left heart cath will follow depending on the clinical scenario. If it's a STEMI, things change. If it's a STEMI, then time is muscle. And the compromise we did in order to add some hemodynamic criteria is that we will get arterial access and LVDP, no time for right heart cath, so we don't delay the possible intervention. So we get the LVDP from the same access that the interventional will use in order to, to cath the patient. And if possible, we will have two attendings interventional in the, in the cath lab, especially if it's a daytime. So if somebody meets the criteria in the blue box, one can do the intervention and the other one can proceed with uh, mechanical unloading. And preferably simultaneously, you may hear more about it. You heard already something about the door to unloading concept, which is not uh, indicated, uh, I mean, class one yet, but because we are believers, we try to do it at least simultaneously. And of course, the right heart cath can follow. And this is the pocket card that all of our fellows carry. And just a couple of things on the data that we already have on the shock teams. This is for uh, Ali Banayosi group uh, when he was in Bad Oidhausen. And using a shock team, they were able to get a 30 days survival up to 70%. As we know, that's a very good uh, percentage. And in our experience, this is the abstract we had uh, months ago at ACC. By now we have, at that time we had 18 patients. By now we have more than 60. And what we showed there, and you can see the outcomes, is that this is something that you can do practically. It tends to have better outcomes. The numbers are low. I want to uh, focus on the time to MCS. Initially, some of the criticism was too many cooks. By the time you guys decide what to do, the patient is going to be gone. So the time to MCS, as you can see here, uh, in, in the shock team was not longer. That's a critical decision time point. It was actually uh, tended to be shorter than the uh, historical controls with the patients that we had in the past. So unfortunately, uh, the first video, which shows in this case the occlusion of the RCA is not playing. But there was a prox uh, occlusion of the RCA in another institution. They revascularized the patient with a stand, and then late hours later, they got the chest pain. Again, and reocclusion. The patient was transferred to our institution. They couldn't uh, revascularize again uh, due to technical issues. And then the patient was transferred to us 36 hours after the initial presentation. We activated the shock team, and this is how the patient uh, was evaluated by the shock team, heart rate 110, and blood pressure systolic 88. You can see the echo. So this is the shock team. The patient was already on uh, Milner, uh from the ER, and this is what we saw when we did the right heart cath and the shock team. I mean, you have half rate cardiologist, interventional cardiologist, and our surgeon. And you can see that this is severe RV failure. The RA is elevated, and it, the RV cannot generate pressure. So this is as bad as it can get with an index of 1.5. So the options that were discussed is reattempt the PCI with impeller RP to see if we can do better and revascularize versus going the OR for right bad or with or without bypass. So we elected to go with the first. Uh, 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 we did the RP uh, impeller placement, uh, the team that was on call, and uh, you, you can see here a still image of the RP. And the patient, uh, we couldn't revascularize uh, as well due to the technical difficulties. And 16 days later, 
there's a new team now. This is 16 days uh, call team change. So the patient is still in persistent severe RV failure, not ambulating, and the impeller had some mechanical issues after the first uh, two weeks. So the options were viability assessment and cabbage, continue RV support with surgical right valve or least for heart transplantation. The shock team again get together, and we decided to go with uh, uh, chronic, uh, sorry, temporary right valve centrumac. And then 31 days later, you can see they are really covered, and five days after uh, they are but uh, was explanted and the patient was discharged home doing well and we aborted the listing and any ideas for uh, heart transplantation. In summary, shock team, the rationale makes sense. Actions to develop a shock team requires coordination but is feasible and data on shock teams, we need, of course, well-designed prospective studies. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>